uh, welcome. And you're in for a treat today because we're going to hear about an amazing place and a place I've been wanting to get to and hear about for a long time. Um, I know just enough to be dangerous about your, your home out there. So we've got uh, Jim and Renee Kimball, the owners and operators of Tranquilla Bay um, uh, Eco Adventure Lodge today that are going to talk to us about their little piece of paradise that they run um, on the Caribbean slope of Panama. So it's going to be really exciting and uh, look forward to it. You know, I'm just going to kick it over to you guys and let you um, take over. Uh, we do have, just for folks to know, uh, we've got a Q&A button on the bottom. And it, if you have questions along the way, feel free and drop them in there. I'll be monitoring that uh, along the way. But we'll hold most of the questions, I think, to the end of the presentation. But uh, feel free to drop one in there uh, in the Q&A box as we're, as we're running along. And we'll, uh, we'll be sure to get your questions answered. Um, with that, Renee, Jim, welcome. And please take us, take us to the tropics. <laughs> <laughs> welcome. Thank you very much for having us, uh, Jeff. It's great to, great to get on here and, and, and be a part of what you, you got going on over there. Um, yes, yeah, you can go ahead and start the slideshow here for me. There we go. Did I, do it? I don't know. There we go. That looks right. Okay. okay I hope everybody can see that there. So uh, if you're, if we're down here in Panama, which is at the, the bottom of Central America. And uh, how do we make it? Just, I just touch it. Okay. So um, if Panama, as everybody knows, is the, the bridge to the Americas. So that's a, a bridge between what would be North and South America. And it's a very tiny little sliver of land. And uh, the most, people, most people think it's a bit insignificant, but actually it's, it's very significant in terms of, of uh, you know, that, that being that bridge and the, the craziness that's gone on in the 5 million years since it rose from the ocean and started to mix these, these fauna from the two regions. And that's another talk that we have going, but I just wanted to let you know where we are and, and how all this crazy stuff uh, happened down here. So for people that aren't familiar with Panama, I'll just start you out real quick there. Um, Panama is a, a, a hub for international travel. Um, it's, it's very friendly. Um, English is widely spoken due to the, the arrangement that they've had with the United States over the last hundred years. Um, it uses the US dollar. There are no hurricanes. The country is full of great infrastructure has uh, the highest levels of, of endemism in Central America and less tourism than most of the other Central American countries that you're familiar with. So here's a, here's a map of Panama, a topographical map of Panama. And it, as, as you can see, it, it's running from east to west. Most people envision it running from north to south, which confuses even people that live here. Um, but as you can see that the Talamanca Range to the west, uh, the canal would be right there in the center near where that lake is. That's Lake Atun, which actually makes up part of the Panama Canal. To the east would be the Darien and Colombia, and to the west would be the, the highlands and uh, what would be the next country over there is Costa Rica. So the Talamanca Range in, in the western part of the country there is the, is the highest mountain range in all of Central America. And it's, uh, it goes right across the border there into Costa Rica as well. And th those two areas have the highest level of regional endemism of anywhere in Central America due, due to this, uh, this, these crazy geographical features that, that you know, are, are home to us here. So um, that's kind of the division of the co country there. It gives you a little clear example of uh, where Panama City is right there on the southern border in the in the middle of the country at the entrance to the canal, the Pacific entrance. Cologne would be on the opposite side of the canal. That's the most famous feature that people know about the country. And if you divide it into four separate quadrants, um, it's, it's, it makes it very easy to, to look at the country in terms of wildlife and, and natural areas and habitats and, and different ecosystems. So there's, there's a little less elevation to the east, as I mentioned earlier, and more elevation to the west. So steeper inclinations and different habitats, higher water, you know, waterfall, uh, stuff like that. Also, it's going to be a little bit warmer towards the uh, historically warmer towards the, the 
South American side and a little cooler due to the highlands in the, in the west. So um, my area is Bocas del Toro. And I wanted to show you this map. This is a map from Google Earth here, a, a picture. And you can see on the southern part of the map, everything on the Pacific side there is, uh, that's where all the infrastructure for the country has been. So you can see where there have been farms and, and uh, farming and, and roads and things like that have, have historically been on that side. And that's due to the nature of the Pacific Ocean being very prolific. And, the, the Caribbean side it was a you know, very much steeper inclination and not used. So from Cologne over in the east of this map to Bocas del Toro in the west of the map, on the northern side of the Talamanca range, which is about in the middle of the country, there is no roads, no ports of call, no airlines, no anything. It's a, it, you can see all that green in the map there. And that's what uh, makes this area so wild. We zoom in a little bit closer on the Caribbean, uh, the, the, the little bit closer to the Bocas del Toro archipelago here. You can see there from where Boquete is at the foothills of the Talamanca range to myself uh, down there and where it says Bocas del Toro province on the east, uh, island of Isla Colón. That goes from 11,400 feet down to sea level and, and less than 35 miles which is a, a very uh, stark dif differentiation in, in habitats from one to the other. So if we start at the top and work our way down, and these are in the areas that we can easily cover from the lodge because of our proximity. So the high mountain of Paramo that starts at 11,000, or, or for us, the peak is at 11,400 feet, and that's tropical alpine grassland. So, all wide zones known to the tropics are, are located here from, from this peak uh, down to, to the lodge itself. That's the Caribbean reef there that you can see the, to, to show you the, the far end stop, of the spectrum. Stop, stop. We lost you for a second. I don't know if I we did. Lost. I don't no. know. I'm going to try again. <laughs> The internet in the tropics every now and then uh, has, gives us a problem or two there. Can you see it now, you. Not yet. Okay, we, okay, it should be pulling right back up. A nice picture of the coral reef. Well, we're gonna try again. Okay. There you go. Take two. Now, that. can you see it? Yep. Okay. You're back. Okay. Terrific. So that uh, for the province of Bocas del Toro, which is like the state, you know, there is a, a province here is um, from the top down to the bottom. Because it covers from eleven thousand four hundred feet down to the to the Caribbean Sea and this coral reef here, and those are all all Holder's life zones known to the tropics. So everything is here for the neotropics. It's really an in incredible area. So this is a, a, an attempt to, to capture that. So that's the top of Volcan Baru there. And down in the bottom is the Caribbean Sea and the mangrove forest. So you can see, it's, it's like standing in Denver and looking up at the Rockies. There's, there's quite a relief here. You know, that's 11,400 feet and, and only 35 miles. There's another shot of it, which kind of puts it in perspective. And uh, you can see those the multiple ridges as you're going to the top, you're, you're working through multiple ridges, which, which form a geographical barrier for a lot of these uh, species. And that's why there's such high levels of endemism when you travel up the hill. So in the Western uh, Caribbean slope of the Talamanca, this is where everything that we do occurs here. So it's the uh, Western slope, meaning the, the Western side of the country of Panama, as I showed you in the map, and then the slope down to the Caribbean Sea. That's the northwestern quadrant of the country. So this area inhabits, uh, inhibits, or has two national parks, uh, La Amistad International Park, which is a, a park that is part Costa Rica and part in Panama, which is almost 2 million acres or over, over 2 million acres. It's close to 3 million acres. It has multiple reserves that act as buffer zones to those national parks forming intact altitudinal corridors. So East of Los Cimentos is obviously at, at sea level and Amistad National Park goes from the mid elevations up to the highlands. 
and they have these reserves like uh, Palo Seco and La Fortuna, which we also tour in, are buffer zones to those areas. And it forms an intact corridor from altitude all the way down to sea level, which is very important. These, this area has the highest, highest levels of regional endemism in Central America, as I mentioned, all life zones known to the tropics. There's a steep inclination on this side due to the way the tectonic plates rose uh, in Panama, give me, meaning most of those mountains back there that you can see are at a 60 degree slope on average and have an extreme annual rainfall of almost 10 to 15 feet, which due to an effect of the mountains being so close to the ocean, mostly occurs at night. So 75% of, of that rainfall is, is nocturnal. Historically, as I mentioned, there was no railroads or ports. There's extreme altitude and variation in a very short distance, and which inhibits, uh, this all helps to inhibit deforestation. There's a low population. It's not a very good place for cattle or agriculture or anything like that. And by keeping these corridors intact from the top to the bottom is extremely important for, for all of the, these animals that, that utilize that. There's a lot of northern migrants that need those elevations in the tropics next to very lowlands. Um, and they, they, they use both as a, as a vertical migration. So why is there so much local endemism? Uh, many of the uh, things that I just mentioned uh, attribute to that, um, but pristine habitat, habitats and intact corridors, healthy transitions, and then all of these different uh, ecosystems and habitats. So deep ocean reef, and these are protected all the way. Uh, deep ocean and reef, islands, beach, mangrove, forest, rivers, marsh, mainland coast, uh, this protected to the open ocean, mountains, and multiple forest types uh, along that, that corridor and, and grasslands, both dry and flooded. And each one of those areas can contain multiple habitats. So the upper montane cloud forest, which is 5,000 feet and above, this, is, uh, this area is is dominated by huge uh, oak trees. And there's, it's, they're, they're laden in epiphytes due to all the moisture content that's up there. It's, it's often cloudy during the midday and uh, it can be very cool. And that, that uh, brings in a lot of birds like trogons and highland raptors, grosbeaks, barbets. Um, solitaire, uh, nightingale thrushes, all these different types of things. Um, very dynamic area. How do I pause? It's a very dynamic area. And uh, as you come down from that below 5,000 feet, that's going to take us to the lower montane forest. This area is dominated by a more waterfall. You start to see a lot more free falling water as it flows from the top down. The rivers get a little bit bigger. There's humidity just like above, but the humidity is, is thicker. And um, just a second, we're having a problem with the screen here. Pause it. Sorry about that. She jumped on us. What's going on? Can I go there? Is that what you want to do? Yes, that's fine. So was that the, the actually I was in the fortune of pause. How do I pause? I'm sorry, guys. Is that where you want? Yeah, right here. If you go to that one, it's going to play. Okay. So just stop there. All right. So the Palo Seco is, is the area in this lower montane forest that we would go to, to explore for different birds. And uh, as I mentioned, it's, a, it's, it's a slightly warmer, but the air is still heavy. There's still a lot of epiphytes and, and bromeliads and orchids and things like that, but they're at a lower, at a lower elevation, warmer temperatures. And down here is where the birds start to get a little bigger and uh, a, a little larger and more boisterous. They want to they want to be seen and heard. And uh, it's a it's an extremely beautiful area and very dynamic, both in terms of weather and and variation. A lot of endemism in that area as well. Then as we move on down, we're going to come to low wet Caribbean force. That's where the lodge is located. It's also on the mainland all the low, lowland areas um, below 1500 feet, I would say. And uh, it's, this is a quintessential jungle like you'd see in a movie with all the animals making sounds and you know, people walking through and steam coming off the ground, but it's, it's not really that hot. Uh, you know, here in Bocas del Toro because of those 
island, I mean, because the highlands being right next to the islands at, at night, that cool dense air out of the mountains falls down. And so our average, our average nighttime low is 73 and our average daytime high is around 80. And our average humidity is around 80. And being in the neotropics, we just don't very much, maybe five degrees over the years. So it's, it's a very mild area. But down in this lower area, we go to an area called the San San Pansac Wetland. It's a Ramsar site, a World Heritage Area, and uh, this quintessential jungle. And in there, this is an extremely important area for wildlife. As you can see, there's a very extremely large area of low wet forest. There's river and delta. There's beach. Um, there's flooded forest. There's non-flooded forest. So all different types of, of uh, there's also grassland. So there's all different types of habitats in here. And it would it'd be very normal for us to see uh, going down this canal, a seven mile stretch of canal, it would be very, very normal for us to see over a hundred species of birds. Okay, can I pause it? How do I pause it? There we go. Um, a very dynamic area. The birds are very colorful. And again, they get much larger. Um, let me go to the, can I just go slide by slide? Which again, this is going to take us down to the mangrove forest. This is the area where the lodge would uh, be located is one of the, the ecosystems that we have here on site at the lodge. The mangrove forest is an unbelievably gorgeous area and it's full of specialists that, uh, that thrive in this environment. There's three different species of mangroves here in Bocas del Toro, which uh, all protect that coral reef that you see down there. They, they are the first area of filtration. Then there's many specialists that live in there. It's, it's, it's probably nature's most well, or it's just a vertically in integrated uh, ecosystem that's incredible from the ground just to the top, which is only in about 50 to 65 feet on the Caribbean side here. Here's one of your, uh, yellow warblers, except he's a resident. He came on vacation and never left, and therefore he gets that red head like that. There's mangrove cuckoos and green ibis are just some of the specialists. You can see the hole through the two mandibles of the, the ibis there. There's a, a hole there, and that's that's actually a thing he uses to catch crabs and keep them squirting out of his beak. So the mangroves are full of specialists just like that. Which brings us down from the mainland now, we are all on into the archipelago here, which is a, an, it's also called the Bocas del Toro archipelago. It gets a little confusing here. There's the province of Bocas del Toro, the archipelago of Bocas del Toro, and then the provincial seat is Bocas Town. So this is the archipelago of Bocas del Toro here and some of its different uh, habitats that it, it'll have are continental shelf, and those are, uh, Audubon Shearwaters, I believe, in that picture there. Um, beautiful birds that, that hunker down to offshore and, and, and feed on all the, the little krill and things that we have going on out there above the tuna species. We have offshore rookeries, which are also a very important area for, for our birds here uh, to keep down the levels of predation from some of the offshore birds. They use these rookeries and um, they're incredible. This, this particular one here, we can see, uh, this is one of the known rookeries in the Caribbean for red-billed tropic birds, the only one in Panama. So each day uh, that we're able to tour to this island here, which is just about a mile offshore, you're gonna see probably a colony of around 100 uh, red-billed tropic birds. Some will be offshore feeding, sometimes they're nesting, sometimes they're not. Um, there's also magnificent frigates, brown boobies, um, noddies show up there sometimes, very, very beautiful spot. Also, there's the coral reef, which almost anybody who comes here to look at the wildlife, sometimes even the bird specialists will want to get into the water and see what kind of um, wildlife it has there. And being so close to the equator, there are, our diversity in the ocean is just like it is on the mainland. It's, it's off the charts. So there's, there's more species. This is probably one of the best areas in, in the Caribbean for species of hard and soft corals and tropical fish, fishes. There's probably we have over 200 species of tropical fish and, and I don't know how many varieties of coral and sponges, they're, they're almost untold, but the, the reef here is very vibrant, very beautiful and, and uh, very well preserved. 
Mangrove forest, we talked about that. That's another one of the major habitats here. And it outlines almost every one of the archipelago islands um, on the leeward side. And some of them even, uh, if, they're, if they're protected on their windward side, sometimes the mangroves are even on the windward side. Beachfront and river mouth, very important habitat for shorebirds, and migra migratory shorebirds, and also a tropical specialist. Low wet forest, as we mentioned, is also uh, encountered and beautiful. That's another picture of Snyder Canal there, which was Panama's first canal, by the way, that was uh, opened up there in, in order to um, uh, make sale of the United Fruit Company from the Schneider Brothers to the United Fruit Company, which in, it was the beginning of the banana industry. A little history side there for you. Okay, my favorite island, obviously, in the archipelago is my island, which is Isla Basquimentos. Um, it's home to uh, Panama's first national or first marine national park, I'd say. It was established in 1988. Um, so it has both a terrestrial section, which takes in about half of the island or, or a third of the island and covering 32,700 acres, and, and including multiple ecosystems and habitats. Um, 12,000 acres of that is, is, is a terrestrial park and the, uh, the rest of it is um, in the offshore. It takes off both offshore continental shelf and some offshore islands, which are rookeries. And it also takes in the backside reef and mangrove is hundreds of mangrove islets. Um, and, and, and it includes the continental shelf, coral reef, beaches, mangrove forest, low wet Caribbean forest, flooded Caribbean forest and caves. And uh, a lot of the islands are karst formations and, and, and have caves on them as well. So here's the boundaries of the, of the national park. And um, right there where it says Crawl Key on the bottom of the map there, there's the Southern Peninsula, which kind of looks like a, a little bit like the boot of Italy. And uh, that's where Tranquilo Bay is located. On the windward side of that, we actually have a coastline on, on both sides of that, of that peninsula. So here's a real picture of it from the air. That's uh, Bastimentos National Park. You can see all the forest. Uh, the dock down there is, is Tranquilo Bay, where all of our excursions would take off from and as you can see everything is fringed and the, the best coral reefs in the archipelago are, are located out here which is one of the reasons that we positioned ourselves in this in this area so as you can see there's we, have no, we really have no neighbors uh, other than the wildlife in the forest isla bastimentos is also very important in terms of um, uh, uh, bio island biogeography um, Island, bio, island biogeography is not only hard to, to say, but it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. And ecological and historical factors which have shaped the geographical distribution of organisms over time. So species vary geographically based on all different types of factors such as latitudes, habitats, uh, being segregated as in an island is a classic case or, or elevation changes uh, above tree line or, or when it gets too cold for certain insects, for instance. And Bocas is full of geographic anomalies, as is the, uh, the islands itself. They were, they were separated. Um, island separation was about 10,000 years ago. And due to extreme diversity in island biogeography, um, the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute often refers to Bocas del Toro as the Galapagos of the Caribbean. You can see this. Uh, there's a, a, a peninsula sticking out into the archipelago, which comes from the bottom left corner of the screen, and that's actually the mainland. And then you can see several islands surrounding this. Well, some of those islands are very close to the mainland, and other ones are far away. So that causes a water gap, and that water gap is one of the reasons that makes the islands uh, is so different. So some of the diversity that occurs in the islands. Uh, for instance, uh, would be a stub-tailed spadebill. So the stub-tailed sp spadebill, which can be seen right here in, in our backyard, only occurs in Panama on the islands of Bocas del Toro. You cannot find it anywhere else in the country on the mainland. The next closest species, or the next closest population to here is completely on the other side of the Talamanca Mountains in, Costa in northern Costa Rica in the dry forest. So how this little group of birds ended up here before the rise of the isthmus and, and, and got 
stranded here on the islands 10,000 years ago after the last glaciation and the, the water rose is, is pretty neat. The, the distribution of golden collared mannequins. Golden collared mannequins are a species that ranges from Colombia on the Caribbean side to Panama. And right before you get to Costa Rica is the Changanola River, which was the one I had showed you in the San San Pansac picture. And that is an area of hybridization between what is the golden collared mannequin and the white collared mannequin. It's a very thin hybridization zone. And then you go over into Costa Rica, they would all be white collared mannequins. This is also another instance of this. The Upago pamelia, which are the poison dart frogs. These are uh, beautiful creatures. Bast uh, the strawberry poison dart frog of Isla Bastimentos is famous. It's famous around the world for these poison dart frogs. And one of the most incredible things here in the islands is that on each one of the islands, you can find a different species, or excuse me, the same species, but a different morph of, of that frog. So this is the strawberry, as you can see from the black spots that look like the seeds and the redness. This is the variation that we have here on Isla Bastimentos. They can have wet pa or white pads sometimes, sometimes white throats and sometimes not. But as you move to Isla Cologne, that's the same species of frog, but completely different coloration. Right on the mainland area or one of some of the other islands, um, just off is, is another one. This is the blue Upaga pamelia, which is also the same species, but a completely different frog. Isla Popa, Cayo de Agua. It's just very interesting. And that's in terms of other wildlife, the monkeys. Well, you know, on this island, there are Western night monkeys, which were not found in Costa Rica. So this is their farthest northern range. And you won't find them on some of the other islands. We also have white-faced capuchins, which you won't find on the other islands. On the other islands are mainly howler monkeys. So each island has its differences, different habitats, different plants, different animals, and obviously different birds. So I think um, that's a pretty good idea there of, of the areas that we tour, what you have chances to see, and you know, mammals and reptiles and, and so many different other things are, are, are talks for another day. Uh, and But I've got a slideshow here I, uh, I would like to show you of some of the birds that um, and animals and, and plants that you can see in the Western Caribbean slope if you were to come down here. Um, so I'm just gonna let these scroll and, and let y'all take a look at them. And uh, I'll come back with some questions after we're done there. It didn't make any sense.
Okay. Sorry that that went by so fast, guys. Go back to the top. Yeah. Sorry that that went by so fast. There, when we um, it, it transferred this these picture slides into my keynote, I think the default was set at two seconds. Those were supposed to be about four seconds. I apologize for that. Some of them are really beautiful, and I hate going through them so quickly. <laughs> um, I just want to tell you a little bit now about the lodge, right? Where we're located, and some of the um, things that you can find here. So this is a aerial photograph of Tranquilo Bay. Um, the, the dock right down there is on the coral reef, as you can see. Then we move into the mangrove forest, and then we would move into the low wet Atlantic forest, they call it, which we have both habitats of, of flooded forest and high dry forest. In the background, you can see uh, past the islets and and some of the other islands there, you can see the uh, the Talamanca Mountains in the, in the background there. So um, some of our facilities that we have here on site, that would be the main lodge building there. This is where we serve all of our meals. Everything here is, is elevated and has uh, wraparound porches, which allow for really nice wildlife viewing right, right from the facilities. So this is where we would enjoy breakfast, lunch, and dinner unless we're having it out into the field and in a place that, that you can uh, congregate or, or enjoy things any time during the day. We also have, um, well, we have guidebooks and things like that are also available there. This is the uh, picture of the dining room where, where we take our meals or, or out on the porch. We also dine out outside. Here's one of the one of the cabins. So the whole facility is forested and full of. Um, we've been done plantings of of all types of uh, flowering bushes and fruiting trees to bring the wildlife right to your cabin. So they're actually very good viewing spots right there. Here's one of the interiors of the cabins. Everything's air conditioned. We have all tile floors and granite countertops, private bathrooms with hot water, and not nice large porches. We also have a canopy observation tower, which gets you up to the level of the forest to see some of these specialists that are hanging up in that area. We also have trails throughout the facility. Um, if I didn't mention it, we're on a couple hundred acres. Tranquilo Bay is, is, a, is a private reserve and we have 200 acres, which borders both uh, the Reserva de Wagara, which is a 500 reserve acre that we got created and Bastimentos National Marine Park. So we're, we're completely surrounded by all of the protected areas. Throughout the trail system, there's some seating areas which are really good for wildlife viewing. This is an area in the forest where the hummingbirds like to bathe, a little creek where, where they frequent, frequent every day to take their baths. This is out on the front dock taken from the ocean, looking back in. It's a beautiful place where we start out all of our mornings when we go out into the field. And it's, it's also a place where you can come down at your leisure and uh, go kayaking or snorkeling right right from the dock there. We take out most of our um, trips or, or that aren't on island or go by boat. So we don't have any roads or cars here. Everything goes by boat. Now, when we do go onto the mainland, we would park at a dock um, and then we would start birding our way up the hill in a van. But other than that, everything out in the ar archipelago is, is done by boat. Um, here's some contact information for Tranquilo Bay. If you're interested in getting in touch with us and experiencing anything that we have down here, we would certainly be glad to answer any questions that you have or help you out when you're here. And with that, I'm going to uh, let it go back to Jeff there. I hope everybody um, saw the presentation well. It came through well there. Again, I'm sorry but that the picture scrolled through too fast. Um, but Jeff, I'll let you take it back over. All right. Uh, no, sounds good. And um, just to let everyone know, uh, I didn't really talk about this in the beginning, but uh, one of the exciting things is COA is now partnering um, with Tranquilo Bay. Um, we're going to kick that off in earnest. Uh, myself and one of our um, pro staffers uh, that hopefully some of you probably will recognize the name and know, uh, Luis Glaze. Uh, are going to go down there on a digiscoping expedition um, in the middle of June. And you'll see uh, a lot of content coming out of there um, 
from us. Uh, we'll be kind of also probably putting together uh, future opportunities to take people in. So um, yeah, stay tuned with that. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of fun stuff. We do have a few questions, uh, Jim, which I'll um, ask. I mean, Anna Kernega, I think I said that correct, said there's a wonderful place and she hopes to visit again soon uh, that says that you've touched their hearts. So there well, you go. Well, that's very nice. It's good to hear from you, Anna. Um, <clears throat> Anita asks, is there a specific time of year when the humidity and temperatures are the lowest? And I suspect that's going to be not really, but you can tell us. Well, yeah, Little um, variation. I, I would say, I would probably say that the, the time of the year um, when the humidity and temperature, the lowest down here in the islands would probably be in September and October. Those are um, our driest months. It's uh, leading into the winter months. So the days are slightly shorter and uh, it's at least on the Caribbean slope, it, the slope, it's a transitional period before heavy rains start up in the mountains. So uh, th th I would say that's probably the driest time of our year. But, uh, but again, you know, it's pretty mild, like a, a, a daytime high for us is 86 degrees. Our humidity, our normal humidity is about 80 or 81 percent. And those don't fluctuate. Now, that's not to say that we can't get a day that's in the 90s, but it's rare. You know, everything's pretty much the same here. And the fact that it cools down each night to 73 uh, on average, it really, it, when you start the day out, it's not already stifling like it can be, uh, Jeff, as you know, in Florida or Houston, where I'm from, uh, you can wake up in, in a July or August month and it's already 90 degrees when you go outside. And when you start from there, there's nowhere to go but hotter. So it's pretty mild here, but that, that September, October timeframe would probably be the best, best spot. Okay, um, that's a good one. Um, Clyde Stevens wrote that in 2017, he recorded tropical mockingbird and yellow-headed caracara at Hospital Point. He's wondering if they have spread very much into the bocas uh, or any other new species showing up out of range. Um, the tropical, we have noticed tropical. Hey, how you doing, Clyde? Clyde's a very good friend of mine and was integral in getting us started down here in Bocas del Toro. I actually rented his house for a few months, uh, six months to get to get started when we didn't have anything there. On the mainland, we haven't seen any tropical mockingbirds out here on the islands that I've noticed, but we do see them in Punto Robalo when we go to the mainland quite frequently. Um, in Palma Real, the little village there, we always see a tropical mockingbird. And uh, what, what was the other one? Um, oh, yellow-headed caracaras. We do see them in the islands now. We did not up until about, I would say, eight years ago, we listed them on the mainland um, exclusively. And then I would say maybe eight to five to eight years ago, we saw the, our first ones out here at uh, Tranquilo Bay. And there's a nesting pair around here somewhere. I, I haven't located their nest, but we see we see two of them around here frequently. Good to hear from you, Clyde. Awesome. Um, Yvonne was wondering about what bat species, you know, you have a few examples of the, the common bat species you may see or? Yes, we have um, white lined bats. We have Jamaican fruit bats. Um, there are, we have like five, five different species of bats here. Those two I know are here at the lodge and, um, those, you may be better to get back to you via email. I've got, I do have all those listed actually on the webpage, on, there's a mammals list, which will have every bat species that we've listed, but the most common ones here at the lodge are white lined bat and uh, Jamaican fruit bat. We do have there are other species that are here at the lodge, um, but I don't know, maybe only like uh, five or six that we've listed even in, in all the areas that we go to. Oh, sure. fish eating bat as well. I forgot to mention that one. That's, That's a very really interesting cool, bat right? species that, yeah. that eats, yeah, they, they, they catch the minnows. They, they read the schools of minnows off the surface of the water and they eat them. That's awesome, wow. Yeah, um, yeah. One of the common questions that a number of people ask is, is, you know, how do you get there in logistics? And maybe you want to address some of that. It also might be a good time um, to talk about, you know, currently what's going on in Panama and particularly, you know, travel restrictions uh, and how things are coming back from the pandemic. If you want to tackle I'm gonna let Renee, I'm going to let Renee answer that question. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so to get to, to get to Tranquilo Bay from the U.S., you can fly out of 
there's several places in Florida you can fly out. You can fly to Houston. You can fly out of Dallas. You can fly out of Dallas, Denver. sometimes from Denver. So it all just depends. And certain LA. Out, of, out of LA and even out of San Francisco, certain times of the year. Not all of those flights have come 100% back, um, but they are working on getting them back. And little by little, the flights are starting back up to where they're coming more regularly. Once you land in Panama City, then if you arrive before, it used to be before noon, you could make it in the same day. Um, it now it just kind of depends on the flight. So as you're looking into it, definitely let us know what you're trying to do and we can see what we can do to help you. At this time, you're gonna take a separate flight from there, you fly into the international airport and then you would transfer over to the domestic airport. And that's about an hour that you need to allocate between depending upon traffic. And um, then there's a, about an, a, not quite an hour long flight from Panama City out to Bocas. Um, and they're running two flights a day at this point. Little by little, they'll increase at different times of the year. During high season, when things are really moving, they've had as many as five flights a day. We have two airlines that fly at this point. Um, we have Air Panama and another airline called Bocas Air. And Bocas Air is relatively new. It's a gentleman who used to do private flights and has then kind of moved on and is doing um, several flights a day as well. Then as far as we're, Bocas del Toro is open and Panama has- on, uh, on the flights there, a lot of people ask what kind of planes you have. These are, um, they're turboprop planes, dual engine. Um, they seat 50 to 55 people. Um, that's the normal one that they're flying from Bocas. So it's 50 to 55 seats, dual engine, turboprops. And then Bocas Air, which is the new airline, I think it has 14 people. So it is a smaller plane um, that, it, that it does. So then but Panama has been open to travelers since October and there are kind of different things going on. And there's a page that we have linked on our COVID page on the website that talks about the different requirements. But right now you have to have a, a negative test to come in within 48 hours. If you don't have the negative test coming in, then you do have to take a test at the airport. Um, and if, there's a if the test comes in at the airport negative, then you have to go through a quarantine period and there's documentation on how that works. Um, if you are traveling from anywhere in South America, India, South Africa, or the United Kingdom in the last 15 days, then you're gonna require to take a test upon arrival and you do have to quarantine for three days, but everywhere else it's open. You just have to have the test to come in and show. Um, they're talking about changing some things with the vaccine to where you don't have to have the test, but that has not happened yet. You can also, they change it to where you can bring a personal test with you and use that if you need to. But that's only for returning back to the United States. That right. is not for coming into Panama because the U.S. still has a requirement that you have a test upon leaving. And there are tests available on the, on in de, for departures for people from the U.S. who have to take tests to go back in. You can either do it at the airport and they have that available and you just have to allocate a couple extra hours to get there and take care of that. Or there are different clinics in Panama City that you can do upon departure. Again, the flight's going back out. We've got two flights a day. So depending upon the time of day that your flight departs Panama, you may or may not be able to make it all in one day and you may need to allocate staying a night in Panama City. There you go. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, you know, um, as, as you know well, but maybe some of the people um, that are tuning in today, you know, I, I can't think of an industry that was hit maybe as hard as you know ecotourism in general, and and we saw some some big big major uh, names fall in that period that have been around forever, you know, without getting into it. But um, I know it's been a tough road, and I'm really happy to see that uh, you know that we, we're getting the vaccines out, that things are starting to trickle back to normal, um, and looking. I'm I am so ready. My wanderlust is. At, <laughs> that's the one that's one thing we've noticed is that the few you know since we've reopened the the people that we've had coming through here are so happy and ecstatic to just get out and and move around and do something that that they're not worried about all the extra protocol yeah it's overdue right um and this yeah. is the new normal we'll have to all adjust you know but i mean the the alternative is sitting at home so um it's we we all have to you know kind of 
uh, work our way through this. But uh, you know, it does seem like we're we're heading in the right direction. Happily, um, Yvonne asked, uh, "What current vaccinations um, are there?" And, and asked if they're the same for Panama, which I assume is a yes. But I'll let you handle that one too. Well, I mean, the, the CDC has a list of, of suggested vaccinations when you're traveling to Panama that they've always had. Um, that has not changed at all during the time frame. And um, we let guests kind of check into that and see what they want to do on their own. Our, I'll give you an example, um, like for my children, they've had the same vaccinations as people in the United States in a coastal area. So nothing, anything more particular for us. Um, I they, they used to include malaria here, but they took that off years ago because there hasn't been any cases in decades. So mm -hmm. that one was that was always a biggie for us, but that was removed, um, and now they don't have that anymore. Um, I don't, all the other ones are pretty regular. Yeah, I think so. And I noticed that somebody had asked about the the bird list. Um, if you go onto our website, and I'll I'll give you the specifics. I'll, I'll list it out. It's https backslash backslash tranquilabay.com slash birding. That page has got the list of the bird the bird um, species. It's got a download on that page, so you can download it from there. There's also a, a button on the homepage that just says birding. Yes, there. there's a birding page there, on the homepage. There's also on the homepage, you can just click a, a button that says birding somewhere, I think up at the top there. Yeah. And that'll also take you to a page which will um, have the bird list on it. Nice. Um, Patty uh, has asked, and this is a good question, um, is there a high level of mobility required to navigate uh, even the lodge and its facilities? The, if um, we do have stairs, so you know um, everything here at the lodge is uh, all of our buildings are about 40 feet above sea level, 35 feet above sea level, and rolling hills. So you know you you arrive at sea level, and there's two cases of stairs or two sets of stairs to arrive at what would be ground level for the lodge, basically. Then the lodge building itself, um, you know, the dining areas on the second floor. And each one of the cabins are elevated and have five or six steps to get up to their porches. So, um, you know, and things are kind of spread out. So everything's private and we didn't affect nature in order to, um, you know, to build, build out the lodge here. So if, you know, we, you know, we walk around and we use stairs and there's hills. Those are, you know, basically, and, and when we go on tour also, you know, we don't have any long, giant, arduous walks that are five miles, you know, through a muddy forest or anything like that. But we do do some walking and there are some some inclinations, some slight uh, inclinations. And then there's staircases. And, um, you know, as far as getting in and out of the boat, there's always uh, the captain and the guides are there to assist people with their equipment, with hand with everything as you're getting in and out of the boats, which is the same anywhere in the world. But since we do do boat travel, um, you know, that, that is an issue for some people, but there's always, we always someone here to give you a hand. And you can go slow. Yeah, so we don't, no one's in a rush. And, and any tour that you're taking, you're gonna have your guide with you and also boat captains. So there's always people to help you out. That's good. Um... Yeah, it looks as though that wraps up the questions that we had, uh, you know, just on an outside note, like I said, uh, really looking forward to getting down there. Um, and the one thing I noticed today too, I mean, I was, today was the first I've done any studying because I've got some of the other stuff that was ahead of that trip down. And I started, you know, uh, refreshing my memory on some of the stuff. The one thing I realized, I haven't been to Panama since um, 2014, I guess was the last trip, but um I'm looking at the pictures that I took that I thought were really good at the time, and compared to my, compared to my current equipment, I, I, you know, I would I'd be deleting a lot of these, you know, that were keepers back then. So I'm really excited to get down there with the new gear too and uh, put it through its paces because you know the uh, the cameras have gotten more sophisticated, the, the phones which I primarily use through the scope has gotten so much more sophisticated, and then the scope itself is a better piece of equipment. Um, um, we're gonna we're gonna have some fun. I can't wait to get my hands on some of that stuff, man. Yeah, um, yeah, we're gonna get it all set up. Uh, yeah, just it's nowadays. Back back when I started, it was it was all fine. You could just say you saw something, but now if there's not a video with the yeah. bird doing a dance, it didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, Pixar didn't happen. That's the new normal. Um, <laughs> got some more questions because we're babbling here. Uh, Ralph was asked, "What type of insect uh, pests do you have to put up with, and what is the worst time of year?" 
I did note that you said on the island there's no uh, there's uh, no venomous snakes uh, on one of the slides. Correct. Yes, but what about that's, in that's right. Well, other than we have a fly called La Cabeza, which has a head about this big. I'm just kidding. No, um, we have, uh, as you know, from Florida, we the, the little critter called the noceum. We have noceums. And um, they are, the, the beautiful thing about a noceum is they're so small, they can't really tolerate sunlight. They would evaporate it like instantly and turn to dry dust. So they're really in the early morning and late evening. If there's a hatch, there can be some no sins. Usually our program uh, kind of works around that, you know, we're eating breakfast at the time that they're the worst or whatever. Um, they're not really bothersome. They're easily protected with long sleeves, uh, you know, light clothing, anything like that. They're too small to get through. Like a mosquito can get through a shirt, but a no seam can't. We have very few mosquitoes. Um, there, there's all, the island is complete, all hills. And so there's a lot of runoff. So we get you know a few mosquitoes of species that breed in leaf litter or something like that, but they're really not bothersome. You know, if you're walking on the trails, um, you might see a mosquito buzzing around you, but there, you won't find any on you. There's just not a lot of mosquitoes here. I'm from Texas and I'm sensitive to those little critters. Um, as with anywhere outside, you know, we have some horse flies. Usually a wave or two of the hat deals with them. Um, so really, to tell you the truth, I know that the, the tropics has a bad rap for being buggy and all that stuff. But I got to tell you, um, this is one of the least buggy places I've lived. I, I've, you know, being in Texas, I go to Florida all the time and we're there treating all these things and spraying. We don't do any of that here. And the natural, the, the habitats are just in such good um, alignment. Everything kind of takes care of itself. So it's not that we don't have them. They're just not really a problem. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, how far in advance to make reservations? Uh, and is there a, a season? I, I suspect right now it's like it used to be different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different story right now. Things are coming back, but so it just kind of depends. If you want to travel during um, peak travel season, which would be from December through the end of April, then you probably should make your reservation a little bit further in advance. Um, because that's our high season and things fill up faster during that time frame than others. We go into what we call our green season on May 1st and that lasts until December the 14th. And in that time frame, other than migration periods, we're fairly open. You can make a reservation when you choose to. But for the holiday period and um, February, March and April of next year, we have some availability at this point um, for that period, but otherwise, um, you know, that, that would be a time frame if you wanted to travel then, then I would say you should start looking at it now. Otherwise, a month or two out is not a problem. Um, just really depends on when you're comfortable and when you're ready to come down here. We'll be here waiting to welcome you. Beautiful. And uh, the final question, uh, how do you get to the lodge from Bocas? We, uh, when you come, when you fly, you know, you, your domestic or your international flight comes in, you transfer to the domestic airport and you take your domestic flight. We then have a guide would be greeting you at the airport. So they have a sign there that says Tranquilo Bay in your name usually, or just Tranquilo Bay. And then um, they will be able to see that as they come off the plane. And then they would, that person would greet you. That person would take care of your luggage and you would have a short um, ride about one kilometer some people like to walk, uh, some people like to ride. That's to the boat dock. And then, then we would get on our boat and head to the lodge. And that, that is about a 25 to 30 minute boat ride from where we dock our boat in Isla Colon to Tranquilo Bay itself. Yeah, and there'll be cold drinks and all that kind of stuff. In town, after you leave the airport, you'll have an opportunity to use the restroom if you need to. And then uh, when we head out to the lodge, we always have the igloo with cold drinks. So. The, your sightseeing and birding starts immediately. When we get to the doctor's magnificent frigates, there could be Jaegers, uh, gulls and, and terns and all that kind of stuff. And we just start heading out. Nice. Um, well, you get more and more questions, which is great. You know, people are interested. That's terrific. So Yvonne's asking, uh, you know, you've triggered her with the, uh, the, the mention of migration. She's asking, we're talking passerines, shorebirds, uh, seabirds, and then what about raptors? And I assume it's yeah. all the above. But yes, 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 and yes. Um, 
the shorebirds you saw some of the pictures and 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 the, the um scroll through there unbelievable warblers passerines all that are, are, are coming in and the raptors is probably the most amazing thing just because of the how much the volume is so it's anywhere from seven to nine million raptors a year pass right through here and as i showed you the geography of panama that topographical map there's a pinch right at the uh, right at the Bocas del Toro archipelago. The, those highest mountains come straight down into the Caribbean and those birds are forced to fly right through the, right through the ocean there. So at one year, one time of the, at the year, which would be the spring migration, they're closer to the mainland and we see them whenever we are touring on the mainland. Uh, and they, they do come out over the islands a bit, but typically in the spring migration, they're, they're more on the mainland. And it's spectacular what we see there. I mean, literally, it can last for hours and you just leave, you just walk away because you're tired of seeing the river of birds coming over. Um, and then and during the fall migration, they come out over the islands. They fall a path right over the island and they come directly over our head. So we can be in the lodge and someone will come out and say, migration, and we go out there and it starts. And, and the majority of these birds are gonna be turkey vultures, swains and hawks, broadwing hawks and Mississippi kites, but we also get the, um, the swallowtail kites and a, a, lot of, a lot of different ones. Merlins, they all, all come through here. Um, peregrine falcons come through in heavy numbers. So yeah, the migration here is incredible. It's really incredible. And I assume that fall period was probably September into November primarily? Yeah, exactly. That, that fall, the, the, you know, every year the migration of the raptors varies, but if you said like, the first of October through the first of November would probably actually the first of October through about the third week in October would probably be somewhere within the peak. Okay. So it's going to start. It starts with the raptors. The first raptors are going to be the swallowtail kites, and they're going to start in August. They they just leave Florida early and come down here for whatever reason, uh, but they're going to start it off, and that's going to be the beginning of the mi migration then they're going to be the earliest to go back home. Uh, so they're going to, uh, but I would say September, it can happen. Um, it starts to filter in, but the, the glut always seems to be that, that sweet spot in October. Yeah. So pretty similar to what we see here in the Florida Keys. You know, we do sponsor the, the Florida Keys Hawk Watch as well. Right. And that, you know, the peak season, like you said, is that first two week period in October, probably here. Yeah. So not surprising. Um, very cool. Uh, Betsy asks if you have many single travelers or is it mostly couples and families? Mostly couples and families, but we do get single travelers, no doubt. And we, we have some cabins that are set up for that, as a matter of fact. Yeah, and it, it also just kind of depends on the time of year and or um, like traveling. We have all the different um, birding operators that come usually have individuals that travel with them within the groups as well. Um, but we have individuals that travel as both with or during regular time frames without the groups. Um, but like during the holidays or during spring break, you're gonna see a lot more of a family type situation. And a, a lot, it depends on the activity too. Um, some people that come down here to do like strictly photography, that's such a time intensive and, and things, spending so much time by yourself. A lot of those people will travel by themselves because they don't have another person that's as enthusiastic about it. or maybe their spouse doesn't care about photography. So some people will take special trips like that or a fishing trip or something maybe they'll come and they'll be they'll be by themselves okay um anna just reiterates and travel to the lodge is a beautiful experience we loved it <laughs> yeah, I think Anna's coming back i'm telling you you're gonna see anna pretty soon. i got a feeling yeah. She's, she's like me. She's like, you know what? This is me fired up. I'm ready. <laughs> you can come back and look through some of those new beautiful Akoa optics here. Yeah, the views will be even better than, than the last That's one. Right. <laughs> so will the pictures. All right. I think we've about tackled it, and I am really excited. Thanks for taking the time. I'm glad that, uh, yeah. you know, um, this worked out for us. Uh, like I said, I can't wait to see you on your turf rather than you know wandering around some yeah. gymnasium floor at a bird festival which has been right 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 where we see each other right That's but it. um it'll be really exciting so uh thanks again for everyone that tuned in uh on the holiday weekend 
uh, especially for those uh, here in the United States. And um, keep an ear out, uh, follow. We'll be having more interesting topics coming up soon. And um, be looking on our Facebook pages um, in, I guess that'd be what, the third week in June, between the second and third week in June for, um, you know, a lot of stuff coming out of, uh, out of Panama, a lot of content. So looking forward to that too. And yes, otherwise, sir. let everyone get back to their Saturday, enjoy the weekend. Um, and again, it's a pleasure talking to you guys. Uh, thank bye you bye very guys. much, thank everybody. You. Thanks for coming.